Hi, and welcome to Mrs. PM Reads. Remember, I've lost our J when we were transitioning locations. We are continuing in Zoo by James Patterson and Michael Ledwich. We, oh, I lost my spot. We will be in chapter 80, and I'll talk about last video while I find it. Uh, in our last video, uh, let's see, they bombed, the military bombed the Florida Everglades to try to get rid of the animal swarms. And Oz was going from D.C. to New York and en route to catch a cargo plane. And his, um, they went under a overpass and someone dropped a, a bucket of something that smashed through their windshield and he's in a car wreck. And that's where we stopped. So chapter 80, dark. At first, I thought the rhythmic thump, thump, thump was my heartbeat. Then I opened my eyes. I realized the noise was the windshield wipers beating uselessly against the shattered windshield. The truck's upside down shattered windshield. The SUV had come to a rest on its roof in the left lane. I was being held in place by my shoulder belt, dangling like a bat. I felt hot blood from my nose dripping into my hair. I sneezed and sprayed a mist of blood onto my one good suit. I blinked, staring out through the hole in the windshield. My thoughts were slow and oozy. Hmm, so what now? I turned toward Alvarez. He was upside down, like me, still unconscious and bleeding steadily from a gash in his temple. I reached out for his seatbelt and was stopped when I looked out the window. In between the steady slap of the wipers pushing glass crumbs into the car, I heard a strange puffing sound. Outside the passenger side window, something was moving. I squinted at it, brown, brown, brown. An enormous muzzle and small beady black eyes appeared in the window. Oh, okay, I thought, that's a bear. I, it gazed through the window at me with an almost quizzical expression. What I was feeling wasn't even quite fear. What I was feeling was the fear equivalent of when you're so sad, you laugh. The wheel of fear went around a whole turn, came out the other side. I thought, well, this is it. How a grizzly bear had gotten here on this strip of road beside our wrecked truck was unclear. What it was doing in Washington, D.C. was unclear. Escape from the zoo? I had a feeling that it didn't work for the AAA. It made choppy huffing sound again and pressed its moist black snout against the glass of the window. It sniffed at the glass and then made a low throaty moan as it scratched at the window with a paw twice the size of a catcher's mitt. The screech of the bear's claw on the glass snapped me out of my little absence seizure. Fumbling with my seat belt, I realized I stretched an arm into the back seat, feeling for Sergeant Alvarez's rifle. I abandoned my search for the rifle as the bear moved from the passenger side to the front. I felt the truck lurch upward as the bear began sneezing himself under the upside down hood. Not sneezing, squeezing. <laughs> oh my gosh. So this is how I will die, I thought, eaten by a grizzly while hanging upside down in a car wreck. Interesting, at least. If, years before, you'd gazed into a crystal ball and told me that was how I'd go, I genuinely would not have believed you. 
I turned to Alvarez and tried to shake him awake. For what reason, I didn't know. To wake him up for his death? I wasn't sure. I guess I didn't want to die alone. In any case, he was out for the night. The bear had shimmied its mass under the hood and was now nosing the hole the compound bucket had made. It sniffed and huffed as it began peeling back the shattered glass. The bear ripped the glass as though it were a kid tearing into a stubborn candy wrapper. Then I remembered the grenades that dangled like avocados from the sergeant's vest. I unclipped the first one I could reach. I bit out its pin and tossed it at the bear as hard as I could as it poked its head in below the upside down dashboard. The bear roared and reared back as the hissing canister clanged off its head. Interesting experience having a bear roar in your face. The bear shook his head as if he'd been slapped. Instead of exploding, the canister came to a spinning stop on the asphalt under the hood and began pouring out canary yellow smoke. Roiling acrid fumes burned my eyes. The smoke stung like wasps' stings. I covered my mouth as I coughed. I reached over to Alvarez and managed to wrench another grenade free from his vest. But by the time I was ready to throw it, I could see I didn't need it. Beyond the window, I saw the bear in retreat, bounding over the grass beyond the shoulder of the road. When the air cleared, a long minute later, I finally disentangled myself. As Alvarez was hacking up along by the time I got him out of his seat belt as well. We crawled out of the wreck. The SUV looked like John Belushi had crushed it against his forehead. What the hell just happened? Alvarez said, slouching against the Jersey barrier touching his face and inspecting the blood on his fingertips. It's just like bees, I said to myself, looking at the smoke billowing from the tree trunk. What bees, said Alvarez, rooting around in the wreck for his rifle. You okay, Professor? You bang your head. When the animal smells us, they want to attack us, I said, crouching with him behind the overturned truck. Anything that masks our scent makes us invisible. That's why the smoke drove off the bear. It knocked our scent out of the air. No shit, Alvarez said absently, shouldering his gun. It makes perfect sense, I said. I was thinking out loud. Beekeepers use smoke in the same way. When the keeper shakes up a nest, the bees produce a pheromone that signals a mass attack. Except nothing happens because the smoke disperses the signal. So, that's what happened to all the animals, Professor? Why they swarm together? They've like bugged out or something? Exactly. They've all bugged out, I said. Now, Call one of your Marine buddies to get us the hell out of here. We need to tell them how to fight this thing. Chapter 81, U.S. Army Manhattan Secure Zone, Upper East Side, New York City. The freight elevator is pretty rank, even before Private First Class Donald Rodale starts collecting the gap garbage. Yeah, <laughs> garbage from the Fifth Avenue Emergency Government Residence that evening. By the time he's done at 6.30, the lush, steamy aroma from the chest-high pile of greasy garbage bags is making his eyes tear and his lunch churn dangerously in his gut. Stopping the old manual elevator in the basement, a particularly slimy, hefty cinch sack slides off the top of the pile and smacks him in the back of both legs with a wet splatter. Bullseye, Rodale thinks. 
Rodale opens the gate to the building's rear courtyard and begins carrying out the garbage bags one at a time, tossing them into a plastic rolling bin. When the bin is filled to its brim, he gets behind it and begins rolling it up a steep ramp leading to 81st Street. Huffing and slick with sweat, Rodell scowls when he makes it to the top of the ramp. The little security booth by the gate is empty. The guard at the booth is supposed to kill the juice on the electric fence and cover him with an M16 while he makes the journey across the street to toss the trash into the shipping container. But he's MIA. What to do? The guard, who's usually at the booth, is a cop named Quinlan. Cool dude. He doesn't want to get him in trouble for not being at his post. Problem is, if he waits around here any longer, he'll be late to help Suskin, a whiny prick if there ever was one, with the porta potties across the street at the museum. He's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. Rodale looks down the long dark corridor of East 81st through the chain link fence. It's empty, just a narrow lane of brick and granite townhouses, trees, empty sidewalks, no rabid packs of crazed animals, nothing at all. F it, Rodell thinks. Only take a second. He leans into the guard booth, hits the cutoff for the electric gate, and swings it open. He pushes the garbage bin through. It makes a rattling, rumbling sound on the concrete as he pushes it off the curb toward the green corrugated fiberglass shipping container they're using for a dumpster. Rodale notices something funny when he reaches out to pull up the handle on the container door. It has already been pulled up. Had he forgotten to close it yesterday? The door yawns slightly open with a groan. He pushes it all the way open. The dark container stinks even worse than the freight elevator, like something rotten, something dead. Rodell holds his breath. He tips the bin over and starts tossing the bags as far into the container as he can throw them. The heavy ones he grabs two-handed and kind of wheels around with them <laughs> like a discus thrower to get some distance. He's almost, almost having fun. When he's chucked about half the garbage bags, he hears a sound like something moving. He's not looking in the container. He figures the sound was one of the bags he had just thrown rolling back toward the entrance. He lays his hands on the next bag. A heavy one needs both hands. He's about to do his Olympic toss thing with it and is reeling back when from, the, from out of the shadows of the container's interior, there appears, oh boy, a chimpanzee. Rodale stands at the door, still holding the garbage bag. Yes, it's a chimpanzee. Face like a strange rubber mask, sweet, lucid eyes like marble brown glass. This chimpanzee is wearing a hat. The hat looks battered, threadbare, and filthy, but it looks like it was once red. It continues to stare right at him. It looks as if it's about to say something. In the last two weeks, since all the crazy stuff started, he's seen dogs attacking and rats. But a chimp? This is unexpected. Hey, he calls into the shipping container. His voice bounces off the narrow walls. He doesn't know what else to say. Are you okay? As if in response, the chimpanzee grabs him by the shirt with its huge black hands, lunges forward, and bites off his nose. Rodale falls to his knees, the air pulling a scream like a long scarf from his throat. Blood dribbles over his lips and chin between the fingers of the palms cut to his face. The chimp makes a high piercing call sound from the town out 
house on the townhouse beside uh -oh. beside the container animals begin to emerge they come from the windows they come from the alleyways from the brass mail slot in the red townhouse door in five breaths the street is crowded with mange models mottled with teas feral dogs raccoons hundreds of cats but by and far, the largest contingent is rats. Thousands upon thousands of plump, red-eyed rats. They make a living carpet out of the street, squeaking black tide. Rodale runs, holding his face. He tries to run back to the fence. When he's in mid-stride, oh, the animals take him under. He sinks into the ocean of dogs and rats as if he's drowning. Like a drowning man, he flails and thrashes. The rats envelope him. They scurry over the back of his legs, his arms, back of his shirt, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we're going to skip this. Rodale is dead. Uh, Attila spits out the shoulder's nose, so shoulder, soldier's nose, and is knuckle running at a loping cant across the street toward the open gate of the building. Behind him, the animal horde follows, snapping and howling. And that's where we're going to stop. Ooh. Interesting place to stop. Now, of course, we have to ask the question, why isn't Chloe answering the phone? I imagine we're going to find out in the next video. <laughs> All right, you guys, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining me and I will see you next time.